this morning our message is going to be more of a devotional style, just some thoughts that um, have been on my heart over the last two weeks. Um, we did a 24-hour road trip to Philadelphia, 24 hours one way and 24 hours the other way, and so a lot of time to think, a lot of time to process, and um, and so just a few thoughts that have been on my mind. I don't know about you, but whenever I get to a new year, it causes me to pause to reflect on everything that's happened in the past year and also ideally what I would love to see happen in my life in this new year on a personal level. It's made me think about where I'm at in life, where I'm headed, should God give me many more years to serve. I trust as a steward of God's grace that each of you is thinking about your use of the time that God has given each of you. Now what up? offer you a perspective that might um, jar you, might confuse you. As I read through scripture this past year, it made me, made me begin thinking about how different God's view of time is from our view of time, especially our Western view of time. Peter tells us that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like as one day we sank, we read it in our scripture reading this morning. Moses exclaimed that a thousand years in God's sight is like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night, Psalms 90. To us, a thousand years might be a long time, but to God, it's just another day in paradise. And what struck me as I read scripture is that God is terribly inefficient by our standards. He's really inefficient if you think about it. And I say that with absolute reverence because I don't want him to strike me down or anything, but he's very inefficient when, I, when we think about it. When we read the Bible, it strikes me how God could have administrated his eternal plan much more efficiently than he did. Why take 4,000 years from the fall of man before he actually sends the Savior? Why wait that long? Why bottle up the process with one disobedient nation and then for the past 2,000 years with one disorganized, dysfunctional church? The angels could have done what God wanted to do in a few weeks or a few months, and yet here we are living on a planet where probably two to three billion people have yet to still even hear about Jesus even once. Our American culture is obsessed with efficiency. I got a new cell phone this past year, and I love it. But being honest, if Samsung comes out with a new phone this year, and it's more efficient than the one that I have last year, my first inkling is I want to trade in my old phone for a new one, just because it's faster, just because it's more space, because I want what's new, what's faster, what's good, right? I don't want to wait. We have instant everything in our society that helps us perform tasks much more quickly. Instant coffee, instant camera, instant music at the sound of your voice, instant pot, instant information available on any conceivable subject. Computers can do in seconds what it used to take a whole office weeks or months to do a few years ago. We've got the one minute manager, we've got the one minute Christian executive, we've got the one minute Christian father. If ever, something is more efficient, we want it. As a culture, we're taught to be efficient in business since time means money. Management courses teach us how to squeeze the most out of every day and every hour. We are even efficient about our recreation. We listen to Audible while we jog on a treadmill that tells us our heart rate and how many calories we're burning. We get everything done at once. We want efficiency even on our downtime. The two simple things I want to point out when it comes to God's view of efficiency compared to our Western mindset of efficiency. First of all, God made people with less efficiency than our culture would like. Think about child development. We push our kids toward achievement to stimulate creativity. We're told to play music to them while they're still in their mother's womb. We decorate our nurseries to maximize intellectual and sensory development. We waste no time signing up our little ones for music classes or sports recreation. We buy them educational toys and games, enroll them in progressive nursery schools, get them personal iPads and laptops so that they won't be at a disadvantage later in life. Our goal seems to be to make childhood as efficient as possible. But why did God design the maturing process to take so long anyway? 
animals mature and reproduce before human beings are even out of kindergarten. God could have done a lot more. God could have gotten a lot more use out of us if he had made us like that. Parents could get through their child-rearing years in a fraction of a time and get on to more productive things. Kids could be fully functional adults making it on their own in about five years. Listen, I've got a four-year-old. I'm looking for year, year five, right? That's true. As I think about my own life, I can't remember much about the first 10 years of my life. From age 10 to about 20, I remember a lot of stupid things I've done, things I'd rather forget from 20 to 30. I knew, thought of I thought that I knew a lot of things that in my 30s I, that showed me really I didn't know anything. And here I am at 40 realizing I still don't know anything, right? And I'm beginning to get up to speed on life and I really don't know much. Still, life is not very efficient. Think about sleep. Think about rest. If I could, I would love to go 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I still wouldn't get everything done that I need to get done. Life is short enough as it is, and yet then my body demands that I have to sleep, spend one third of my life sleeping. I try to get by on less sleep. I even prayed about it, asking God to give me more energy during the days on the days that I don't get enough sleep. If I could function on five hours or six hours of sleep, I'd gain at least 14 hours a week, but my body just won't cooperate with me. What a waste of time. And then there's that weekly day of rest that God demands that many of us in our modern church ignores. Take one day off the week from your normal work to worship, to rest. Really? I've got too much going on and there's a day you want me to do nothing but rest and worship? I'm behind already as it is. How can I get through my week if I don't do my normal chores and things I need to do on a Sunday? Think about how we would have designed people if God had given us the opportunity. We'd have them fully mature at a younger and younger ages until it was down to about age one. We'd eliminate sickness. We'd eliminate sleep. Retirement and old age would get pushed higher and higher. We'd make people so much more productive. Think about how our economy would thrive if we could just redesign people. God didn't make us sufficiently efficient. Second thing, God uses people with less efficiency than we would. Again, in this area, it's God's ways is not our ways. Enoch was the most godly man ever to live on the face of the earth in his day, but God takes him from the earth at about 365 years, less than half the lifespan of the next shortest person that was recorded in time. Why not leave Enoch around for another 600 years so that his godly influence could make a difference in the world around him? Noah was almost 500 years old before God told him to build an ark. And he spends 120 years working on an enormous boat. It would have been much more efficient for God to judge the earth by sending a plague rather than waste 120 years of Noah's life building an ark. Noah lives to be a 950 years, but all we know about Noah is that he built an ark and later one day he got drunk. Think about all that we could accomplish if we had 950 years to live. Abraham was 75 years before God began to work in him. Better than 500 for sure, but still not very efficient, God. The Lord could have started with him when he was 25. When Abraham was 75, God promised him a son. But then God made Abraham wait 25 years before that promise became a reality. Why waste 25 years? What did Abraham achieve during those 25 years? Was he sitting around making goals and planning on how to become the father of a great nation? Did he have his Google calendar filled with appointments after appointments so that he could plan for the future of his nation? What was he doing? We don't know. He wasn't doing anything of eternal significance that we know of. Think about Joseph. Joseph is a guy we all love. He's efficient. He's smart. He must have been efficient because he was effectively running Pharaoh's famine relief program. God must not have wasted any time with him. He was sharp. He was honest. He was trustworthy. He had high moral standards. This young man had what it took to be a leader. And after a brief apprenticeship with Potiphar, he would be ready for a top management position in some ministry organization. 
But God puts him in an Egyptian dungeon on a false charge for a better part of his 20s. At one point, he had a good chance of getting out. He interpreted the dream of a fellow prisoner, the cupbearer. The man was reinstated to his position, and just as Joseph had predicted, Joseph's parting words to the cupbearer was, Remember me. But the cupbearer forgot. Couldn't the Lord have, in a dream, reminded the cupbearer about Joseph? Couldn't the Lord have done something to tell the cupbearer, hey, there's Joseph that's still in prison. In Genesis 41, we read of Pharaoh's dream, where Pharaoh has this dream that eventually leads to Joseph's release and sudden rise to power. But in verse 1, it says that it came at the end of two full years. Pharaoh had this dream. Two years. Two years from the cupbearer's release to the time that Pharaoh had his dream. You and I, we can read that verse in a fraction of a second. But that was two years of Joseph's life. 365 days times two. Sitting, doing nothing. Two more years in a stinking Egyptian dungeon. Why didn't God give Pharaoh a dream after just two weeks? And you can multiply example after example after example. God leaves his chosen nation in bondage in Egypt for 400 long years. God calls Moses when he was 40. Why not 20? But Moses blows it and then has to spend 40 years alone in the wilderness before he can lead the people out of, out of Egypt. And then he spends another 40 years wandering around in a wilderness with a bunch of grumbling, grumbling people, even though Egypt to Israel was just an 11-day walk. They spent 40 years there. David, the young man after God's own heart, was anointed king as a teenager. And then he spends his 20s fleeing from the madman, King Saul. After David, God allowed some of the worst kings to reign in Israel for decades. But he took some of the godly kings in their prime. At the end of the Old Testament, God waits 400 years after the last prophet before he sends the forerunner and then the Savior. Think of how long 400 years is. It would take us all the way back to the Renaissance. People were dying without the Savior. From our perspective, 400 years is not an efficient use of time. And yet from God's perspective, Galatians 4 says, when the fullness of time came, God sent his son. In God's eyes, God's program was right on schedule. Think about how God's inefficient use of his messenger who opened the way for the Messiah. Jesus refers to John the Baptist as the greatest man ever born of a woman. Think about how much that great man would have done with 30, 40 years of ministry. But God only uses John for about six months before the wicked king Herod puts him in prison. And then one night Herod gets drunk, lusts after a dancing girl, promises her almost anything, and she wants John's head on a platter and he's dead. Could it God have used the life of such a great man more efficiently than this? And once the church was established, after the ascension of Jesus, God chose Paul to launch the whole thing into the entire Gentile world so that Gentiles could hear about Jesus. If there was ever a key man in God's program, it was Paul. Surely God would put Paul out there into ministry right away. After somewhat of a late conversion, or probably in his 30s, Paul spent several years alone with God in Arabia. He goes back home to Tarsus for a few more years before his ministry ever launches, before anyone ever notices him. Remember, Paul was a trained rabbi. Paul knew the Hebrew scriptures well from the start of his conversion. Surely he would have been qualified to teach. Surely people should have been knocking on his door for God to use him. And yet God had him waiting for years before using him. And then think about Paul's life. He encounters numerous problems and frequent opposition. Could it God just provide enough support to this apostle, to the Gentiles, that he didn't have to waste his time making tents while he was preaching the gospel? Couldn't he take away the thorn in his flesh so that Paul could serve in full bodily strength? Couldn't God get rid of those pesky Judaizers who kept annoying him and bothering him, who kept dodging Paul's steps and undoing everything that Paul had done? And to add to this, there was beatings, there was jail times, there was shipwrecks. What a waste of 
precious time. What a waste of precious time. As Paul dreamed of taking the gospel to Rome, to Spain, to points beyond, God saw to put it fit, God saw it fit to put him in custody in Caesarea. And yet it was God's way of getting Paul to Rome. All expenses paid. But in Acts 24, we read that something that shouldn't surprise us by now. Acts 24 says, But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul imprisoned. Two inefficient years sitting in a jail in Caesarea. Here's God's main apostle in custody for two years while the Gentile world was dying without the gospel. Weren't there people that were praying for his release? Couldn't God overcome the political maneuvers of a petty governor in Judea to free his man? And Paul wasn't getting any younger. You and I, if we were hanging out with God, we could teach God a few things about efficiency, couldn't we? Think about the only perfect man that ever lived and marvel at the inefficiency of God. If I was Joseph or Mary, I would, knowing all that I knew about Jesus, I would have had this boy preaching by the time he was 12. Surely the religious leaders were already marveling at him. He could have drawn crowds by the thousands by the time he was 20. Why have the Son of God waste 30 years in Nazareth as a carpenter when he could have been reaching the masses? Why give him only three years to minister before he dies. And yet, although we would have had a much different, more efficient use of Jesus' time in ministry, he, John says that he accomplished everything that the Father wanted him to accomplish. Listen, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that we sit around and waste time. Wasting time is sin, just as much as wasting money is sin. It's poor stewardship before God, but I encourage you to set goals and try to use time efficiently, but I am suggesting that God's concept of time and our concept of time are not identical. And we need to get God's view. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Some of the things that we think are a waste of time may not be in God's eyes. And some of the things that we think are so efficient and so good are really a waste of time from God's perspective. Maybe you're not as efficiently conscious as I am. I go nuts if I get stuck somewhere and I, don't have, and I have to wait and I don't have a book with me. I like getting things done. On my trip to Philly and back, I finished three Audible books at 1.5 speed just so I can finish the book faster. I like getting things done. I like efficiency. And so it shocks me. It bothers me. It annoys me when I realize how inefficient God is. So what's the point? What am I trying to drive home this morning? I'm way too efficient to simply say amen and let you go home and process this on your own, right? So <laughs> I'm going to give you four action points, four things to think about. Uh, Four things for you to think about this year. Four action points. Number one, I really encourage you to take time to walk with God. Take time to walk with God. You know, it's instructive that the Bible often refers to the Christian life as a walk. Seldom a run, never a mad dash. Walking isn't the quickest way to get from point A to point B, but we're instructed to walk with God. Enoch walked with God. This implies spending time alone with him. If you always do your quiet time on the run or not at all, you're not walking with God. You need to take time to read and meditate on his word to assimilate it into your life. You need to set aside time to pray and to worship God. Worship, by the way, is a terribly inefficient activity. You realize that? When Mary broke the alabaster bar, uh, alabaster bottle of perfume and poured it on the feet of Jesus, the disciples all remarked, why this waste? 
They were concerned with efficiency. They were concerned with management, of time management, of money management. But Jesus was concerned with devotion. He commends Mary. Listen, you and I, we need to join Mary at the feet of Jesus. And as you read God's word, use it to evaluate your own life and, your, and our own culture from God's perspective. Do you realize that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they really didn't accomplish much for living for so long? What are they known for? What have they done? And yet they're held up to us as models because these were three men who walked with God and were obedient to whatever God told them to do. As you read the word, constantly pray that God will enable you to live in a manner that's pleasing to him. That should be our main goal. That should be our desire. Listen, if you've never done it, why don't you try to read the Bible this year, the whole Bible? If that's hard, commit reading through the New Testament. Or commit to studying one book in deep depth and studying what that word means. Devote more time to reading good Christian books that help you grow in the Lord. Get audible. It's fantastic. Um, but grow. Spend time with God. Take time to be with God. Number two, take time to be with your family or people that matter the most. Take time to be with your family or people that matter to you. Listen, not many people get to 65 and say, I wish I spent more time on my business or I wish I spent more time on my career. But many will say, I wish I spent more time with my kids. I wish I spent more time with my wife, with my husband. All the efficiency-minded folks say that you must spend quality time with your kids. But listen, I don't buy into that. My kids are not going to say to me, God, Dad, thank you for those 10 quality minutes. Right? They're going to say, they're going to appreciate quantity. They're going to remember quantity of time that I spent with them. Not that I spent 10 minutes doing something that they really enjoyed. They're going to remember over and over all the times played games with them, hung out with them, spent time with them, spend time with your family. Take time to have a family vacation, especially when your kids are young. You don't have to spend a pile of money. Gary Smalley, in his book, If Only He Knew, interviewed more than 30 couples whom he picked because these couples seem to have a close relationship to their children, many of them teenagers, and they seem to be happy and close to their parents. And he asked them, what is the main reason you're so close and happy, and happy as a family? Without exception, he got the same answer. We do, this, we do a lot of things together. We do a lot of things together. Take time to be with your family. Take time to be with God. Take time to be with your family. Number three, take time to be with God's family. Take time to be with God's family. The same principle applies to the church as to the family. You will have the greatest impact for Jesus when you spend time with other followers of Jesus. Listen, those of you who are older in your faith, you need to take under your wing those who are younger. Paul teaches that. Get involved with fellow believers in a closer way than just occasionally seeing them on a Sunday. We're family. And when God's family gets together, we, would, we should want to be there. Be committed to being here on Sundays because this matters. If you're content with just showing up to church every once in a while, can I humbly admonish you that you're doing your own life harm? And if you have children, you're doing the life of your children harm. You communicate to them that faith is something you do whenever it's convenient, and when they grow up, don't be shocked if their faith isn't of importance to them at all. Be in church. Get involved in a missional community group and do life with others in your community. Join a Bible study with two or three other men or two or three other women and grow deeper in your faith. Be involved, committed to the church. Number four, Take time to reach out to lost people. Take time to reach out to lost people. I will acknowledge that this is the most difficult for me because I work around all Christians and then my families are all Christians um, and you guys are all Christians. So, I mean, my entire circle of influence is Christians. But 
We need to have an outward focus. My prayer for myself this year is that God would give me a heart for the lost, that I wouldn't just simply overlook people as I interact with them. You know, even in his three years of ministry, he, Jesus spent much of his time in social, social situations with lost people. I think he wants us to do the same. Ask God to use you to reach out to those who don't know Jesus, to love them, to befriend them, to point them toward Jesus. These four action steps are just God's two greatest commandments and the Great Commission, broken down into four subcategories. First, love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind. Be devoted to him. Second, love others as much as you love yourself. Love your family. Love your other believers. Love those without, that don't know Jesus enough that you would reach out to them with the good news. Listen, I know what some of you are thinking. When will I ever find time to do all of that, right? Um, spend time with God. Spend time with family. Spend time with other believers. Spend time with those outside of church. I'm already too busy. What should I do? Let me give you some practical advice. One suggestion. What are you doing that's not worth doing? What are you spending time on that really isn't necessary? Maybe it's watching too much TV. Maybe it's on the internet too much. I'll tell you one thing for me, when we first moved to Dallas, was mowing the lawn. I hated mowing the lawn. It was a waste of four hours of my month. Pay someone 20 bucks every other week. It's done. That saves me four hours. Right? What are you doing that's really not worth your time? You need to have some downtime, but you've got to put a limit on it. Build your life around loving God and loving people. Cut out from your life things that don't contribute to those priorities. Evaluate. What are those things that are not helping me? What are those things that are not pushing me to grow, to mature? And ask God, what are those things that I need to cut? Another suggestion is for those of you who, like me, tend to be efficiency-minded. Relax. Relax. Let God run the universe and take time to enjoy him. Enjoy his creation. Enjoy the people that he's put around you. You can rack up a list of accomplishments that are humanly impressive, but they will all be wood, hay, and stubble at judgment. Or, you can know God. You can walk with Him so that the things that He accomplishes through you are gold, silver, and precious stones on that day. A relatively short life where you walk with God and have His blessings is far more effective in God's eyes than a long life full of human accomplishments that lack God's blessings. However many years that God gives each of us, let's pray what, Paul, what Moses prayed. As he considered the eternal God and the shortness of our lives, he prayed what we read this morning, God, teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. And he, honor, and he ended, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and do confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work. I invite you this year to pursue God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Can I invite you and encourage you to make your family a priority, that you don't put work and everything else over them, that they're neglected? Can I invite you to make church a priority? Can I invite you to have a heart for those in your life that God has brought into your life that don't know Jesus, that you don't just ignore them, but you pray that God would open doors so that they would get to know the same incredible Savior that we serve. Can I invite you to relax? That God is doing what he needs to be doing, and he's doing it on his timetable, and he knows better than you, and he knows better than me. He will accomplish what needs to be accomplished. You can relax. You can trust him. He's got a plan and purpose for each of our lives, and he will do it when it's time. He will open the right door 
when it's time. He will close the doors that need to be closed when it's time. And he knows when that time is. And listen, he hasn't failed you yet. He didn't fail you in 2017. He didn't fail you the year before that. If he has been faithful in the year past, as you look from January through December of this year, you can trust that he'll be faithful. Same Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. He orders every step that you take. He leads you. He guides you. You can relax. He will do what needs to be done. And as you trust him, as you lean on him, as you rely on him, you will stand before him one day and he will say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. As you come to communion this morning, can I invite you to meditate on the work of Jesus, the work that Jesus accomplished, so that this morning you and I could have a close, intimate relationship with the Father who ordains every step that we take. That because Jesus was willing to give his life in our place, we have a God who holds us in the palm of his hands, who never lets go, who's watching out for us, who's he's ordering our steps, he's already gone before us, and he's taking care of us. So as you come to the table this morning, as you meditate on the body that was broken, on the blood that was spilled for you, can I invite you to simply relax and trust that he is faithful, that he is absolutely